Good morning, folks. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us this fine Thursday, uh, where you're from. Um, I have uh, immense pleasure in hosting this uh, AWS Blockchain Executive Panel Series. Today, uh, we'll be talking about uh, achieving success in a consortia, and also a case study from the insurance industry. Uh, the panelists that we, hear, uh, we have here needs no introduction. But before going into the panelists, uh, you know, let's, let's set the uh, stage. Uh, let me start with my introduction. So my name is Vijay, Vijay Krishnan. So I am one of the uh, blockchain architects on the AWS side. I specifically lead the uh, partner segment on the blockchain and work with uh, multiple partners in the industry. So you also have uh, Fletcher Mecker, my partner and uh, uh, partner manager for the blockchain segment with the AWS. So we also have uh, on the standby, on the chat and Q&A to support us, uh, Sandy, Barbara, Sophia, uh, you know, so you can post your questions on the chat and, uh, uh, you know, expect answers, you know, these guys will be supporting us. So now let's jump into our uh, guest introduction. Uh, before going into that, you know, just, uh, like I said, I just, let me set the context here. So today's panel discussion will be on blockchain uh, case study from the insurance industry. And the objective is to uh, derive key, key learnings from the uh, blockchain consortium success. Uh, there's a lot of uh, blockchain consortiums there, and I feel uh, Riststream is one of the leading consortiums in the, indust in the industry. And our panelists have uh, vast experience and background in the industry as well as in the consortium practice. So we'll discuss on some of the best practices, some key insights, you know, uh, some pitfalls to avoid when building a consortium, or if you're part of the consortium and you are trying to operate and you know what, what can go wrong. So we also will uh, deep dive into an uh, application called uh, Mortality Monitor, so which is part of the Risk Team Consortium. And uh, Brian will talk more on the uh, Mortality Monitor application. So this conversation will bring us uh, you know, three different perspectives, one from an operator side or an ownership side on the consortium, one from the participant side, and one from the technology provider side. So now let's jump into the introduction. Uh, Patrick, I'll start with you. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thank, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm Pat Schmid. I'm the vice president of the Risk Stream Collaborative. We're a uh, risk management and insurance blockchain consortium. I oversee our core business, including our products, our relationship management, our op operations, and our technology departments. Uh, through these lenses, I work with staff to coordinate the Risk Stream Consortium of insurers, brokers, and reinsurers. And in doing so, work with staff members and technical partners like Steve and his team in developing production ready applications with the goal of lowering costs, improving the customer experience and driving efficiency across the insurance industry. I've been working in the insurance industry for about a little over a decade and my background is in economics. Great. Uh, let's, let's jump into Brian. Brian. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Oberman, Director of Engineering in the Technology Innovation Lab at Securing Financial. I've been in the industry for over 30 years and also with Securing Financial for that long. I primarily uh, have an engineering architecture background and uh, my role in the lab is to look at new and emerging technologies, maybe not new to the world, but new to Securing and finding ways to apply that to solve business problems. Appreciate you having me here today. Thanks, Brian. Steve? Hi, everyone. Uh, Steve Cervini. I'm the CEO of Kaleido. Kaleido is uh, a software company that's focused on helping uh, enterprises adopt blockchain. So we, we have um, a set of products and a, a SaaS platform that, that we run with our partners like AWS that's available around the world. Um, I know this particular um, webinar, we're going to go deep into the insurance industry, the solutions there, uh, some, some applications. Um, Kaleido is, is a cross industry, so we do have clients in public sector and trade finance, supply chain, um, the healthcare industry, et cetera. Uh, everywhere where there's promise for, for blockchain, as Pat was saying a second out, to really lower cost, improve customer experience and accelerate automation. Uh, Kaleido is working. So excited for the uh, session today. Thanks, Steve. 
Uh, so let's uh, jump right into the uh, discussion. You know, I, I know the audience is still joining, but uh, you know, we want to keep a uh, note of the time as well. Uh, Patrick, let's start start with you. Uh, let's make sure you know every, everyone is on the same page. Um, can you help us understand what is the Stream Consortium? You know, what do you do, and how big is the consortium, and who are the participants, and what are some some of the use cases that you handle in this consortium? Sure. Um... Well, let me start off by saying at, at its core, we feel uh, the technology behind blockchain and broader distributed ledger technology is network driven and enterprise usage of this technology really provides a means to look, work, look at a variety of different problems that plague not only the insurance industry, but to, to Steve's point, broader industries as well. And in our opinion, for enterprise um, blockchain usage, for particularly for shared business problems, a nonpartisan arbiter is needed to kind of test, to learn about, and to implement the technology. The Institute's Riststream Collaborative really emerged out of the Institute's. The Institute's is a not-for-profit, primarily education professional development entity that formed over 100 years ago out of the Wharton School. Uh, the Institute, Institutes educate over 100,000 insurance professionals annually on risk management insurance topics. They have designations like the CPCU for underwritings, AIC for claims, ARE for reinsurance. You get the idea. Um, the board of directors of the institutes is generally chief executive officers who represent uh, a majority of domestic insurance premium volume and the PNC size. Side and uh, sizable international presence as well. So if a private permission blockchain requires a network, we feel as though the institutes have established already a network within the PNC space, um, property casualty space, to establish kind of that same concept on the life and annuity side, the Restream Collaborative teamed up with LIMRA, a research and professional development trade association for the financial services industry. So the risk stream collaborative is the largest blockchain consortium in insurance with over 30 member companies and a broadening ecosystem. Our members include well-known insurers like Travelers, Liberty Mutual, Nationwide, USAA, Brian's team, Securian, um, brokers like Marsh and Truist, reinsurers like Everstree and Renry. We are a separate 501c6 membership organization and not-for-profit that has been working on blockchain and DLT applications over the past couple of years. Today, um, we operate as a consortium that uses our network of member companies to develop industry-specific blockchain applications for a variety of different use cases. And while the activity began on the property casualty insurance side, the life and annuity side of the consortium is quickly catching up. So risk stream members, which are defined as insurance carriers, distributors, brokers, or reinsurers, they lead all the areas of the consortium's governance and activity. For example, members and um, leadership, they work with us to prioritize use cases, to launch working groups, and these groups in turn then design use cases and then work with our staff and our solution providers like Steve's team um, to build out associated applications. And while all of our efforts are really centering around leadership from our members, the consortium has started to create a larger ecosystem. Our goal is to position providers, not-for-profits, what we call collaborators, others that in a sense touch the industry um, in order for us to um, you know, devise solutions and for shared business processes within the risk management insurance space um, and really try to devise solutions that will improve operating um, you know, procedures and hopefully improve the customer experience in, 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 in tangent. Um, finally, our use cases and, and the decentralized applications or blockchain applications stretch across a variety of areas of insurance. So we have some apps in personal auto. We'll talk about commercial lines insurance. Um, life and annuities is really where the majority of our focus is going to be today, um, particularly on an application called the mortality monitor. Thanks, Steve. Uh, uh, thanks, Brian, sorry. Uh, let's jump into uh, Brian. 
Hey, Brian, uh, let's help the audience understand what is Securian's role in this consortium? What is Modality Monitor and how does it fit into the stream? Yeah, so in terms of, let, I'm gonna start with what is Mortality Monitor? In the simplest terms, it's really a solution to help carriers close out and process death benefit claims more efficiently and effectively. Uh, we're hoping by providing a single source of decedent information that will allow the secure and permission-based exchange of this data along Restream collaborative members. In short, Mortality Monitor sets the stage for a large-scale decentralized death registry. This is helpful in really two different ways. One is, um, you know, if someone passes away, right, someone's going through a lot of trouble, it's a very hard and uh, emotional time and they're trying to work through it and it's it's in the interest of the carriers to uh, handle that as efficiently, effectively as well for the customer experience. But there's the other part of it, uh, the unclaimed property part where, and I know we don't have newspapers that, that much anymore, but you know, many times we're reaching out trying to find people that are actually owed money. And so we're trying to solve both of these problems by having a centralized way uh, to meet our legal requirements and to efficiently pay those claims. In terms, of our, in terms of our role with it, uh, Patrick alluded to the organiz organizational structure. I think of it as three parts. There's the advisory level, and that's from executives from across the participating uh, carriers, uh, Riskstream. Um, they set the direction on which use cases we should work on. Then there's a technology group that's cross-cutting and that works across all the use cases, regardless of whether it's property and casualty or life and uh, life and annuities. Um, and then the lowest level is really is where all the work gets done, the working groups, as Patrick talked about earlier. And that's where we participated in defining the requirements for this, along with uh, Prudential and Nationwide and the other carriers. Um, and then uh, actually testing out the solution that Kaleido built, which we're going to get into a little bit later. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Steve, uh, can you help us understand uh, what is the role? of Kaleido with Restream. Uh, how long have you been part of this journey and share some experiences in building this consortium? Sure. Um, you know, we, we've been partnering with Restream for about a year now, and uh, we've collaborated on uh, more than one of their uh, projects or initiatives. Um, and, and the mortality monitor was, was the very first. Uh, so, uh, it, as you can see here, um, you know, Riskstream itself has has been on a journey um, as as their, you know, we were just talking about the the governance side, and Brian was mentioning the organization around the working groups and so on. the The technology itself has been on a, a parallel sort of evolution path uh, over that time, and and Pat could give you, you know, the best uh, set of of details around. The, the early days and, and some of the, the evolutions and the decisions that they made and the key learnings through that. So I'll leave that to him, but just zooming in on that right hand box for, for a minute, uh, Kaleido has been a, a technology partner uh, to Riskstream and, and to its initiatives. And Canopy is the, is, is the platform, it's, it's the stack. Um, you know, we, one, one key thing when you think about enterprise blockchain um, you know, you, you need more than just a blockchain node. There, there are a set of technologies that need to come together and they need to work together uh, in order to build a business application. The, the deployment for those technologies, you, you need to be decentralized, you know, up and down the stack. You need to understand how you're going to leverage privacy. You know, some of this data is quite sensitive. It may, you know, for example, involve social security numbers of, of individuals, right? In, in the case of something like Mortality Monitor, how does that fit and work with the blockchain? What data goes on chain? What stays off chain? How is it tied together? How do identities for organizations fit um, in the overall use case? So there's many technical considerations and Riskstream had an approach, uh, as Pat showed you, all those use cases, they're thinking, not just about a single point use case, but they're thinking about a technology platform that can really, um, really change the game for, for the insurance industry and, and for all of their members. 
and, and so that, that's what Canopy is. Uh, uh, Clido is a, a partner, uh, both in the evolution of that. We also have a SaaS business. So we, we run the, the software as well. And for the likes of Securian, um, you know, we make it really easy for, for uh, them to uh, move quickly, which is definitely a, 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 a key uh, prerogative these days uh, in sort of a COVID era where digital transformation is only accelerating and the pressure on IT teams to really deliver projects to, to move their company forward um, has, has never been greater. And so that, that's one thing I did want to highlight on, on as we think about, um, you know, lessons learned and best practices is the ability to keep everyone moving and maintain that, that that velocity and, and get that feedback cycle from the members, get, keep people excited and, and keeping moving. Thank you. Uh, Brian, I'm going to ask you this particular question. You know, it's, it's been one of my favorite all the time. Uh, can you share us why you need blockchain technology for model, modality monitor? Yeah, it's a great question and one I get asked quite a bit. And you know, I think it's important to take a step back uh, and just think about, I call it DLT, distributed ledger technology and blockchain, right? It's really a solution that implements a decentralized immutable database where, you know, we can have multiple entities securely contribute and consume the data without that centralized control or infrastructure, which is important, right? Because no one's going, no one uh, party is going to own uh, this shared network, if you will. Uh, so we need, uh, we need to be able to allow these parties to come together, remain confident about the security of this solution um, and not have a centralized control such that parties can come and go, right? Because that will happen. Um, I think the other key reason though, probably the most important is really the tokenization aspect. What we built into this solution is tokenization. And it's, it's important to have a business model when you do something like this. And so if you think about carrier sharing data, if you're always the first to share, what, how, how do you gain, right? Like you're helping every, everyone else out and you know, goodwill is important, but I think we need more than that. And so I think having this built-in tokenization uh, via this technology allows us to uh, reward and penalize consumers and, um, of the information and sharers of the information in a way um, that you know, it can be done with other technologies, but I think it just makes more sense and this is a better fit with uh, blockchain. Thanks again. Um, I think uh, now we have uh, some idea about what is the stream and uh, what is modality monitor and uh, how Kaleido is helping build this consortium come into live. Uh, I think let's jump into some of the uh, key business aspects, some technology and operation challenges and how, you know, as a consortium, uh, you know, as a team, you know, you overcome some of these difficulties. I'll start with Patrick again. Uh, Patrick, why you, you, you know, it is important for this team to be a non-profit organization because that's something that you don't see commonly in the uh, consortium business. And uh, give us some background about your participants and what is actually important from the participants uh, side to keep them motivated and uh, be active in the network and what are the incentives you know, what, what is the key mantra, uh, the success factors that you see with the stream and that's working, uh, you know, from your side? Great question. Um, so we think that our restream um, is positioned well as a not-for-profit. Again, enterprise blockchain really requires this network of participating organizations to engage. In many cases, these organizations are competitors. Um, for example, our members within RiskStream are insurance carriers, insurance brokers, or reinsurers. I think uh, Brian put it well, you know, they need incentives to engage with one another. And in addition to that, facilitating cooperative discussions about shared business processes across these competitors is challenging with, within insurance or, or any other field for that matter. You really, we feel, you need a trusted independent arbiter, a Switzerland per se, um, in our case, Riskstream through the institutes, which has been around for over hundred years, literally acting as that arbiter for the industry in a variety of other areas, not only education, but research, et cetera. Same with Limra, 
Um, so there is a there is a reason why not for profits act as a good kind of hub, and you've actually seen this start to develop in other areas where you know um, with what uh, Facebook was doing with Libra or early on, you know, forming a not for profit around that. I think they recognize the need for that independent arbiter. You can't really do it on your own. Riskstream's challenge is really finding the use cases and applying resources in an efficient, appropriate manner to those use cases. Our member companies, uh, those carriers, the brokers, the reinsurers, they lead all areas of our work from our advisory board, which Brian serves on, to the tech committee, to the working groups um, for each application, like we have a working group for our mortality monitor application. And those organizations remain active because they see value. In each area of insurance, whether it's personal lines, commercial lines, life and annuities, or reinsurance, we've evaluated use cases um, across these shared business processes, across the entire insurance value chain, from products and pricing and distribution to underwriting risk management, to policy holder acquisition and servicing, to claims management, to finance payments and accounting, to regulation and compliance. You can imagine the amount of use cases you have across these dis different sectors, across those varied value chains. And our challenge is really prioritizing them um, because there's an awful lot to do in terms of what you could do with this technology. So the list of use cases is very long and the potential is very big. Uh, RiskStream provides the platform for these use cases or these decentralized applications to be built upon and for the enterprise network governance to take place. Um, we also arrange for the prioritization of the use cases and leverage something called RiskStream Labs to do that, which is a process to explore use cases in an open environment where we meet with members, we meet with non-members, we meet with ecosystem parties that I showed you earlier, not-for-profits, civics, um, government organizations, regulators, um, solution providers, and collaborators. And we explore specific a specific use case topic. We ask folks to eventually put stake in the game in order to advance that from exploration to a proof of concept. But we don't want these to be science experiments. At the end of the day, our goal is production value for our members. So we really feel like this process helps us uh, focus on high valued areas. And that process from exploration to POC to pr um, production variant, there's an ability to fail there too, which is actually really important in innovation. We have an ability to fail fast on certain use cases so we can apply our resources to other areas where members feel there's more value. So at the end of the day, we feel as though we're gonna anticipate use cases emerging here across all varied areas of insurance, and that can translate to significant ROI over time. We've looked at about four or five use cases in each area of personal lines, commercial lines, life and annuities and reinsurance, and that could potentially result in billions of dollars saved for our member companies over the course of time. So we're really excited about what the potential is here, but we're really just at the, the first couple steps to get there. And um, I'll leave it to Brian and, and Steve to talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Uh, so Brian, I'm, I'm going to ask you, uh, you know, one, one simple question. So how did you come up with this mortality monitor idea? Uh, how did uh, Securian back up your idea? Or, uh, you know, what is the reason behind go going after this particular use case? And uh, when you uh, you know decided this use case, what was the success criteria? You know what what do you think is a success for this use case? Well, first off, it wasn't my idea, right? So let's start with that. Um, it really the idea came from the consortium reviewing opportunities, right? And and then the the carriers, the members voted on it. And so this was one of two uh, that were active on. There's another one, licensing and appointment that we're not going to talk about today, but. Really, it comes from the advisory uh, committee uh, helping choose and vote on. And so this was one of the two. We thought it was low-lying fruit. Um, we thought by building this network using DLT, we could help carriers uh, do this with less expense and, and do this more timely, right? And meet all the regulatory guidelines that we have and improve the experience. At the end of the day, all the carriers need to do this. And I think we all believe we can compete on other differentiators. And so this is somewhat 
beneficial to everyone. Um, and it's good to have a, a, a Switzerland, as uh, Patrick said. Uh, in regards to Skinner Financial and how we got behind this, um, again, I'm in the lab. And so my job is to be curious and to go out there and try to find ways uh, to apply this stuff. So when we started, uh, you know, we really just had a, a hypothesis that, you know, something like this could be a game changer uh, and could help us. And so that was really what we were trying to go out to prove to be true or false, if you will, right? It was, a, it was an experiment. Um, we think it is uh, useful. Um, and I like to say that DLT is kind of like a football, like you get one for a gift maybe, uh, which I did recently for my son. And I'm like, well, this isn't much fun by myself, right? Like you mm -hmm. need others to participate in a solution that leverages this technology. So if you're looking for ways to use new technology to solve business problems, you've got to have partners. And so that's, that was the impetus to join Riskstream was to say, hey, let's get involved, let's learn, let's see if we can do something with this that can solve a business problem. And so really, it was kind of a low bar at the beginning, I would say, as we look to operationalize this, we will have different success criteria. We're not, you know, we're not quite at that stage yet, but we will definitely uh, need to identify those as we, uh, as we move forward to get to uh, production. Thanks again. So I remember someone said blockchain is a team sport. That, that applies very well. Uh, Steve, I'm, I'm going to ask you two questions next. Uh, one is, um, uh, I personally know Kaleido has helped many consortiums get off the ground and, I, and you guys do it like day in, day out. I want you to talk about some of the initial blockers. You know, when, when you start a consortium, what are some of the initial blockers and how do you build a business case around it? And also from a, a technology side, as a technology provider, um, you know, what is Kaleido's role in, uh, you know, building this uh, Canopy 3.0? What is instrumental behind it? And also uh, why it is important for this stream and how it has helped this team's success? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so sort of take, it, take them in order there. Um, you know, I, well, let me start with a, a very high level basic statement. Enterprises most sensitive data leaves their four walls every day, right? Because no enterprise exists in a vacuum. So everyone's moving data around, whether they're financial instruments or policies or um, you know, information about supply chain parts or whatever it is, right? That data is in movement. And the reality is most of those systems today are legacy maybe all of them, right? And they're built on very old technology like FTP um, or maybe web services. And so the opportunity space is, is humongous. What we find more often than not, especially as you know, enterprise blockchain has been around for, for five years approximately now, uh, is that the companies are one way or other are already together and talking about it, right? Because there are people in enterprises that need to keep these sorts of systems on. There are lots of people like Brian, whose job is to really be looking forward and pushing the envelope. And so Clido does less around, um, you know, bringing parties together or uh, identifying use cases. Well, where we step in is to help you map that business use case to the right technology architecture. And I, I will say that you know, probably with all emerging technologies, certainly in the blockchain space, there are significant challenges there to, to really understand that. I think we're now starting to see patterns emerge uh, in, into how to do this in a best case, a uh, best practice way, you know, golden, golden topology type patterns, those sorts of things. Um, but it's still challenging. And, and so, you know, moving on to the second part of the question, specifically with, with Riskstream, the vision was there around Canopy, as well as the, the um, sort of the learnings and early work and experimentation. And so we, we really, it, it's been a great partnership. Um, and, and no two consortia are the same as to your point around, you know, we, we've, we've seen a, a number of flavors of, of this, um, but certainly some of the choices that, that Riskstream's made um, we think have, have been beneficial both today, but really you're going to see 
um, huge long, longer term benefits as well. So, so being able to sort of play for that longer game, I, I think is a, is a key learning and key insight because there's so much value trapped in, in these sort of legacy processes. Um, uh, you know, there's just tons of potentials once the network's there to really keep building upon it and keep building upon it. Uh, and, and that's why Canopy is, is such, such an important part of, of this larger project, that reusable uh, platform um, with the permissioning and the governance that really is a business function that, that Riskstream drives um, and the technology side of it that Clado provides to enable all of that to be delivered as a service. Um, so so where, what, what that means then going forward is we, we can increasingly start to think about some of the topics that Pat teed up earlier, things, and Brian touched on this too, things like incentivization, right? How do we make sure if the purpose of this system is to share data, how do we hit the right level of privacy for the use cases? Brian was talking about how important that is. Um, you know, how, how do we get the incentivization right so that so that it's a win-win, right? And there's so much, it, it's not, we're not talking platitudes here around team sport and stuff that like it, it is real. And, and the, the size of the pie for, for business optimization, business benefits is large enough um, that, that it's, it's really worth it to, to do some of this hard work, but it's, it's critical for the, play, the network operator, what we would call in our lingo, you know, in this case, risk stream, to really play that, that central role, to, to drive that forward, to get the feedback and input through those working groups and turn those into real solutions. Great. Uh, Patrick, I'm going to switch to you now. Um, <clears throat> so very simple question again, uh, but uh, you know, a very, very important question as well. Uh, you know, can you let us know what are some of the key factors in making a platform choice for a stream? You know, a few years back, it was just, you know, a couple of them. Now there is a plenty of choices to make. And how did you arrive at uh, uh, Kaleido as a platform for a stream? Um, another great question. Um, we've been on a journey as highlighted a little earlier um, over the course of the last uh, four years or so. Um, like many, I think, consortia, we started just tampering with the public blockchain. We, we were leveraging uh, public Ethereum at, in the early days, um, building out proof of concepts on public Ethereum, running into some issues with um, the associated gas charges, learning about that um, as a consortium. And there was a lot of value um, associated with that. From there, in late 2017, early 2018, um, we engaged with Deloitte in setting up our own private permissioned variant of Ethereum. And um, in a sense, we were building the platform um, and then the apps on top of the platform while also building the network consortium. And there's a lot to, to take on there. And um, we, we were relatively successful there, but again, we learned a lot through the process. One of the things that we learned was there was some concern from our member companies about information sharing across nodes on the system. Um, so we reevaluated our platform choice and really created a strategy for what we call Canopy today. Um, so Canopy 2.0 was really our initial version of Canopy and in that, we had some value propositions that we wanted to offer, one of which was, while we need to choose an initial platform for Canopy 2, which we eventually chose Corda to start, um, we wanted to um, abstract away the business logic from the underlying platform with the thought that we don't know which blockchain is going to win the race. So we did that knowing in the future, it could theoretically be any of these. And, Honestly, our hope was to be completely blockchain agnostic and ensure complete privacy and security for our membership and a variety of other things like potentially allowing our members to build their own use case on our platform, that type of thing. As we engaged in that, um, we did a lot of good work as Steve was pointing out. 
Uh, we built out Canopy 2.0 with the help from Accenture. Um, Deloitte was helping us as well. Uh, Ernst & Young helped us from a security audit standpoint. And we built out this platform. And one of the things that we learned through that process was um, it's challenging to, in a sense, build out that platform while you're building the applications on the platform that you're developing. And because of all that, we made a decision in late 2020 after Brian's team did an excellent job, job with Steve and Sophia's team on the mortality monitor use case to really reinspect the market and see if there was actually some sort of platform provider out there that could accomplish some of our initial goals associated with our vision, you know, that blockchain agnostic approach. Some of the challenges we were running into were standing up nodes very, very quickly. Um, Kaleido offered click button node setup and a hosted node solution, which is something we were looking for as a consortium. In addition to that, off-chain capabilities was something we're concerned with. Steve mentioned earlier, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about privacy concerns and that sort of thing. So we wanted to make sure that whoever we were working with was SOC 2 certified, that sort of thing. Um, and also had the ability for us kind of to build once use many. So existing modules, scripts that could help us um, expedite the proof of concepts phase with all of these different use cases that we were talking about earlier. And really what Kaleido offered us was pretty much check boxes for all of these different areas. So with us thinking about what we could do with Canopy 3, it made sense for us to merge these visions with, um, with what Kaleido was offering. And beyond that, we had already seen they were, they did a fantastic job with the mortality monitor proof of concept. So it meshed really well. And now we've been working with Steve and his team, not only on the mortality monitor use case to help those in need, beneficiaries and, and folks like that on the life and annuity side, but we're also doing something similar to that on the personal auto side with first notice of loss data sharing, which is a really neat use case. And we've integrated into the Guidewire claim system. So there's a do no harm approach where we can share information from, from carrier to carrier um, using blockchain technology with you know, their existing systems. Um, so there's been a lot of thought that went through our kind of long journey there to get to Canopy 3.0. But I think I speak on behalf of the members like Brian in the sense that we're, we're really excited about what it could mean in the future because we see that vision of where these use cases could go. And we now have, I think, the tools in place to make them a reality much more quickly than we were able to in the past. Great, great to hear that from you. Uh, more focus on business, uh, leave the technology to the experts and keep the ball rolling, great. Uh, so, Brian, I'm, I'm going to jump to you again. So, two questions for you. Uh, you know, we've been hearing about this term pop in quite a few times today, privacy. So, my first question is, um, so what is the time effort that you spent on building the mortality monitor? And also, could you share us some pain points or challenges related to data privacy with mortality monitor? And how did you address them? Yeah, I was going to say, I think... Just so everyone knows, we built a proof of concept with uh, Kaleido and Ristream. We did it in, I think, three weeks, right? And so I think we couldn't have done that without Kaleido and their proven technology and architecture, right? And we couldn't have done it without Ristream having led through all these working group sessions to define out the requirements for that. And so um, just need to say that in terms of effort, there wasn't that much because as Patrick laid out, right, Kaleido was bringing bringing together this architecture, um, which is quite comprehensive. And, and just so everyone knows too, it's more than just DLT, right? There's, there's on ledger and off ledger, which we haven't talked about, but that's very important for meeting uh, privacy requirements like GBT, GB, G, uh, GDPR, excuse me. Um, in terms of effort, uh, we probably have spent a number of months, uh, probably one to two hours. Shannon's on the call here uh, with us today. And, it was really about two of us, a couple hours a week, working through the requirements, making sure that our needs were represented. Um, we did conduct a, a five-year data study as well. Uh, that took a lot more effort and that's where privacy and compliance and all that came into play. And we had to work through all, our, all of our governance at Secure Financial and so did 
the other uh, carriers, Prudential and Nationwide. Um, so that was probably a heavier lift. I even got a chance to write some Python and uh, put some stuff together. So it was probably about 20 to 40 hours there. Um, but the key thing that we took away some of the privacy concerns for the POC was we generated the data, right? So we generated fake data. There's a lot of tools out there and you can generate it. The data was so realistic that it actually got caught by our uh, data loss prevention tools at Skirian. And I'm like, hey, hey, I, I created these 2000 uh, uh, fake dead people, um, uh, randomized data first and data best. So for the POC, we really uh, sidestepped it as largely as we could. Um, for the data study that we did, uh, we worked, you know, we did a, a hash, a hashing of the SSN, right, um, to, to try to make sure to keep it private. We, you know, we made sure we we're going to destroy the data after the, the study was done. And so I think, I think we will get into more uh, privacy concerns when we move to operationalize. Uh, so long story short, we tried to minimize them uh, to get the proof of concept out there and built uh, for the data study, we couldn't avoid them, and then we just had to address them, and and we did that uh, in a safe and secure way. Um, the other thing is, you know, this is all encrypted, right? You've got a network, right, that's got encryption at the core, and so um, that you know that's just key to this, right? So it's like I think there are ways to to meet all the concerns uh, via the on-chain, off-chain, and then uh, hashing and other mechanisms. Um, but we largely avoided it to a large degree, or at least to the degree we could. Um, but again, to go to prod, we will have to work through all of those, um, all those issues. Thank you, Brian. So there's one question from the uh, audience. Uh, so what does, what does the production timeline look for mortality monitor? I could, I could try to field that one. Um, so it's really dependent on the advisory board and um, you know their priorities for the life and annuity side. But you know our hope is that late 2021, early 2022, it's possible for us um, to not only meet shadow production, but theoretically also potentially move to to production. So I would say Q4, Q1 of 2022 is probably an appropriate you know, point of view right now. We're currently engaging in a variety of different tests related to ethanol, or I'm sorry, mortality monitor and um, having the members, we're actually having onboarding uh, a new member into the LNA side who's gonna be demoed um, what we've done so far. So we're having a little bit of catching up to speed um, and we have some logistics to work out in order to get to the point um, where we could meet shadow production. We've done a lot of this on the personal auto side with first notice of loss in terms of testing. We understand it's, it's not easy to coordinate a variety of different members to test with one another. Um, that's a process and it takes some time. However, you know, if planned appropriately, we think that it's possible that you know, at the very least, shadow production could be achieved by Q4 of this year. And that would mean full integration um, into existing systems. Um, however, it would not mean full production in the sense that necessarily we would be using live data. Um, could be a subset of data, could be dummy data that's integrated into systems. So there's different ways to do it, but we think that shadow production probably likely by Q4 production by Q1 of 22. 22. Great question. Awesome. That's my take, Brian. Do you have any other thoughts? No, I, I like the timeline. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. So, uh, so let's let's not uh, deviate from the privacy topic here. And uh, we have the best man to answer from the technology side. Uh, Steve, I have again two questions for you. Um, you know, how do you uh, handle privacy in blockchain technology? And I know. Uh, Kaleido has a lot of tools and, uh, you know, uh, utilities to handle it easily. Uh, but my question is, how did you help Kaleido, sorry, Restream and Secure and help the privacy requirements? And second thing is, um, when we talk about uh, privacy, there's also risk, right? Data exposure to data availability to a lot of other factors and risk. So what do, you, what do you think about risk in technology with blockchain and uh, how do you uh, handle uh, risk from a, a technology and operations perspective in the blockchain world? 
Yeah, yeah, great. So pri privacy and risk. Okay, how, how many hours do we have to dive into now? <laughs> um, privacy is is a really important topic for, for enterprise use cases. And in fact, as Pat was touching on, uh, you know, it was one of the first things when, when I, I was at IBM in 2015 and working with the research team looking at, you know, Ethereum, the new white paper, Bitcoin. And it was one of the very first things you said, okay, this like enterprises just need privacy, right? There's privacy, permissioning, confidentiality were sort of the three things that weren't there. And so off of that family tree, you sort of had this offshoot of what we call enterprise blockchain, right? And all the different technologies there. Um, and it turned out that even those chains, so, so you had a purpose-built blockchain for things like privacy, whether it's channels and fabric, or you know, whether it's you know the Tessera components in Quorum and for Ethereum, or you know, whether it's R3's model of, of how they attack privacy. Like, but even those weren't enough. And so you started to see all these off-chain privacy options coming along as well. Um, you know, whether it's emerging tech, things like trusted execution environments, so Intel SGX or, you know, Hyperledger Avalon, or whether it's things like zero knowledge proofs, right, that you get into really fancy math that only a few people understand, but, you know, keeps stuff private. Um, but more often than not, we also see just traditional technologies, you know, paired with the blockchain. So things like I have a private doc document management system. I know how to do messaging. I know how to do end-to-end -end encryption. How do I coordinate and sync, you know, off-chain dissemination of data, whether they're messages or documents, with on-chain transactions? And I still get guarantees around, you know, ordering and finality and all the good things that the transaction system of blockchain gives me. So, so with Kaleido, we actually have five different ways to do privacy on our larger platform. And there's no one size fits all. It's all about trade-offs. But what we try to do is give you a, a simple set of APIs and take you out of the plumbing business, right? That's, that's one of our top goals with our customers is sort of to get them out of the plumbing business and back into really building their, their apps and solutions. So that, that's kind of the, the first part of the question transitioning to think about risk. Um, you know, there's, there's more than one way, there's more than one kind of risk. I guess that's why the insurance industry exists, right? Um, you know, but there's, there's sort of a, I believe where you're really getting at is like, a, if I do the wrong thing and how I build my use case, something like that's an immutable, designed to be an immutable record like a blockchain, if I put certain kinds of data on there, that's pretty problematic. Right, and so, and so what we've seen is, you know, best practices emerge where, um, you know, you don't put that data on chain. Well, how do I tie tie my off chain data then to that 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 and on chain proof, right? And so you talk about hashes and hash pinning, um, and techniques like that, and. And I know that that's a whole other sort of topic or field. That's one example of a technique. There are others, um, but risk is, you know, ap application design is something that is, you know, needs to really be considered when you build these systems because you certainly don't want to get far down the process and then engage a risk guy, you know, in your department and that risk person says, um, this isn't going to work. Right, and, and you're sort of back to the drawing board. There are other kinds of risks, though. Just real quickly, you know, in an emerging space with where technology is moving really rapidly, and there's multiple choices. You know, for example, of blockchain protocols, which one do you select? Right, and what what happens if you pick the wrong horse? Um, so that's there. That's a risk to the project as well that we talk a lot with clients about. You know, for Kaleido we've chosen to support the big three uh, that are out there today and to work with our clients for thing to build you know sort of layers in the middle things like canopy where for risk stream they can actually activate more than one protocol depending upon the use case 
And we believe that's going to be really important if you think about how big of a, an ecosystem the, the insurance space is. Um, you know, trying to force everyone onto one specific technology choice, um, you know, may just limit the, the amount of innovation that you see, how, how fast industry, how, how fast those use cases come on. Uh, we want to engage as many, uh, you know, partners as possible uh, to build out this business network. Uh, and, and so there's more to it than just risk, but there are technology risks as well to consider uh, in the overall solution. Yeah, that's true. So we can talk about uh, privacy, risk, governance, you know, for days together when it comes into a consortium setup. Uh, I, I know we are getting uh, to the uh, end of the uh, uh, webinar. Um, so I just want to leave some time for uh, Q&A from the uh, audience. So what we'll do is uh, we'll uh, have one final question for each of you. Uh, I'll start with the Brian, then Patrick, then Steve. You know, you're going to wear a different hat when you're answering this question. Um, so the question will be, what is the biggest challenge or the learning you like to share with the audience? You know, who may be part of the consortium or, you know, who have plans to start a consortium or who is already, you know, uh, uh, joined a consortium and uh, doing some, some role in the consortium. So Brian, uh, to start with you, as a participant of the consortium, you know, what, what would be your, uh, you know, uh, message? And for Patrick, as an operator, you know, what would be your message? And Steve, as a technology provider, what would be your message? We'll start with Brian. Yeah, I've, I've got a couple of things. I think one thing is working in a consortium, you know, you can only go as fast as the slowest member, right? And so it's, it's hard work, right? And it, it takes a lot of work. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to highlight is that DLT alone or blockchain, that's not going to be your sole answer. I mean, Kaleido's architecture, if we, show, if we presented that slide deck, you're going to see you need lots of other parts of it. And I think that was uh, maybe a, a learning for me. I think we covered the tokenization. I think there has to be a, a business model to encourage this. It's got to be more than just goodwill. Um, and the last thing I would say is we've got a chicken and egg scenario situation here, right? Like the network, we all know what the network effect is, right? It's this, this solution becomes more valuable with the more people that are on it, but it's hard to get people on it until you have it built. And so we have a little bit of chicken and egg. And I think that will be, you know, that will be the toughest thing for us to work through here is how to get that moved into uh, what they call the network effect. Patrick? Um, I, I... I echo Brian's thoughts. Enterprise blockchain use cases are hard. Um, yeah, we've seen that they're worthwhile, but they're hard. And competitors agreeing to new ways of doing business um, outside traditional methods. You know, we've looked at you know writing checks or sending emails, what have you. It's easy to see from afar, but actually changing the internal business process is more challenging than one would think, uh, particularly within a variety of players that um, you know, have unique experiences and different perspectives. I think the key reason you haven't seen a, an abundance of players in production yet in enterprise blockchain um, is due to that. And I think Brian put it well, you know, it's, it's due to um, the fact that you have different parties and you're kind of as fast as the slowest uh, party. Um, that said, the challenge is not to do this on your own. I think Steve pointed that out earlier. You can't build a network easily with your competitors. It's challenging. And if you build an application, it will be tricky to onboard your competitors. Um, so we feel as though the Ristream Collaborative is very unique in assisting in that process and bringing these competitors together. I think years have been spent building up to this point personally. So there are certainly challenges as pointed out there. Um, we've created this network now. We now have this platform. We don't need to continue to, um, we, we're gonna need to continue to um, build on that platform with Kaleido. But now the focus on that reusable framework for application development is really becoming a reality. So I certainly agree that the consortium environment is often slow moving, but the exciting part is we've now hit kind of a pinnacle. And I think that that momentum will continue to develop here and uh, likely we'll start to see much more enterprise blockchain 
projects, not only the risk stream collaborative, but I, I think, you know, in other areas of, of uh, business starting to come to fruition. So it's an exciting time for, for blockchain. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, so, well, a um, couple thoughts here. One is just to remind everyone, you know, simple question, are there use cases out there where there, there are billions of dollars in trapped value inefficient processes that could, could go directly to companies' bottom line if, if they fix and, and replace these legacy systems? I think the answer is yes, right? And that's why, um, you know, that's why it's worth it for, for companies to really try to figure this out. We, we've known that blockchain is different, right? If, if you're, if you're going to go into a, a decentralized sort of a, a technology space, um, you know, Brian said it perfectly, you, you can only go as fast as the slowest member. Uh, and so ecosystem building and governance uh, are, are critically important. They're unavoidable, um, you know, part, just part of the journey and, and part of the process. And so um, you can't skimp on, on that business side of it and expect to really get through it. I think the good news is on, on the technology side, things are maturing very quickly. Um, and you know, there, there are solutions out there that don't just sort of get you 3% of the way, but can get you a lot farther, at least, on, at least to building you know, a robust, high quality solution deployed on you know, industrial grade production ready infrastructure, right? So take some of the plumbing off of the table and, and really focus your, your, your energies on the business application. And then think about really the unique opportunities that blockchain brings to help solve this. Um, you know, things like tokens and NFTs, which we didn't talk a ton about today, but are extremely relevant um, to, to really turbocharge uh, the use cases, we touched on incentives to get the incentives right, to really align people to, to behave, um, you know, the, the way that you want good behavior on, on a network. Everyone should be, you know, looking out for their company's interest as well, but a, a well-designed system and use case can, can ensure that the, the, the broader solution ex does work properly, efficiently, and, and exists in harmony. And finally, at the end of the day, it's about automation, right? It, it's about the ability to, to really automate these, these processes, these data flows that, that exist and extend outside of the enterprise. Um, you know, just think about how powerful it's going to be when they are automated and you start to bring in adjacent fields of IT. Like if, if you can automate, um, you know, this, the, the death mass, master record, we're talking about mortality monitor. Um, if you can automate those sorts of things well, what about um, you know, adjacent fields of, of IT like AI? What about for other use cases, IoT? You know, Pat sort of mentioned the automotive you know, part of the insurance business. Well, how do you, if, when you start layering in uh, other pieces of data, then I think you can see just how powerful these networks are going to become down the road, but it all starts with good governance, a solid technology stack and, and getting these early wins and, and, and successes to get, keep everyone in the boat and keep them excited. Awesome, Steve. Uh, I think uh, we pretty much answered all the questions on the panel as well uh, from the audience. So, uh, which is a good thing. Um, so gentlemen, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, having you for the last one hour. And I'm sure you know we'll meet again with uh, a different panel uh, of questions and uh, talk about blockchain, privacy, technology, risk stream, mortality monitor, uh, again and again. You know this is something that has been uh, you know exciting for me for last few years and uh, for uh, many people out there. And thank you for being here and uh, answering all our questions. And I wish you guys all the best and talk to you guys soon. Until next time, we are signing off from uh, AWS Executive Panel Series from Vijay and Fletcher.